Take a look around and find somebody to war eagle. It's showtime. Sing it to me, ladies. Drop a little bass. Now kick it. Well, hello, Auburn, Alabama. At all points around the globe. Where War Eagle can be heard and returned with joy. Particularly in that glorious little wedge of soil between West Magnolia, South College, and Shug. Down past the softball field. Out wire road. Heading out into the sticks. Glorious. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to you. And as always, I hope this message finds you truly well and joyful and that you are bearing the burden of your legacy by teaching the youngins how to say Shug Jordan. Shug Jordan. We don't care what it looks like. Learn it. Honestly, I don't know why every university doesn't have a mandatory class. Mandatory freshman class, first semester, 8.30 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Or whatever. For all incoming freshmen that teaches its history and traditions... Who cares? It's not important, man. You're right. You're right. Who cares about learning history? It's certainly working out well for us right now. Wouldn't want to, I don't know, build complete lives in the university system now, would we? Let's keep it one-dimensional. Come on! What is history? Why bother? Well, hell's bells, man. History is the story of you. And you, and you, and you, and you over there. And you back there. And all your children's. And all them children's children's. It's the story of you. History and traditions are important. Please don't let them die. I remember having this conversation. I don't know. We were driving through Auburn driving around, doing something, I don't know, going to the grocery store or something. I looked at my wife as we were, I think we were at the intersection of uh, North College and Shug, maybe somewhere up there, going to Publix or something, maybe getting some chicken fingers. And I looked at her and I said, I wonder how long it is before Shug Jordan is completely lost. Not because the new folks haven't bothered to learn it or don't care, but because we never taught it. For that matter, how long before War Eagle dies? I don't mean the actual bird. Plural. I mean the greeting. The salutation, the battle cry, the kickoff, the tip-off. Because unlike Shug Jordan, which just might go away to time and laziness, well, there are people actually actively trying to get rid of War Eagle. Don't let it die. Well, that was a screed I didn't mean to get into right now, this early anyway. Hello, consumers of Auburn Broadcast Transmissions, and welcome to Auburn Stuff, the podcast where we discuss the philosophy of life in orange and blue. Warm greetings as well to our valued and beloved listeners from Spanish Fort to Gunnersville, and in... Columbus, Georgia, Columbus, Ohio, 
Miami, Florida, Miami, Ohio, for that matter, Los Angeles, yes, hello to you out there on the West Coast, and the Ivy Motor Scotland, UK, thank you for joining the fun. And today's show is brought to you by Pollen and all the snot and misery it brings. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Spring has sprung. It is currently the 13th day of March, Saturday, 1237, about to flip to 1238 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a few more hours. I know that all of your phones will automatically update the time tomorrow, but don't forget your clocks around the house. Hopefully you have some analog clocks around the house to keep that skill sharpened. Don't forget the car, uh, the clock in your car. And if you're an hour late to anything tomorrow, you're an asshole. And at this point in time, there's no helping you. No helping you. Pay attention. Do better. Make an effort. How you do anything is how you do everything. Anywho, this is an episode, yes, I've been gone for a while. I have been gone. Um, life jumps up and kicks you in the nuts every now and then. Sometimes it does it quite often in a short period of time. This is an episode, has it been about a month? And this is an episode that I've actively sat down and recorded bits and pieces of about eight times before something horrendous happens in or around my house or to a family member or from a family member, whatever. Look, hey, um, if you have young children, enjoy. Take it all in because pretty soon they become teenagers and there's no more horrendous thing in the world. I think the worst thing on earth is a seventh and eighth grader. And then it just levels off into the depths of hell for a while before it starts climbing its way out. Hopefully, if you've done an artful and clever, diligent job at trying to wade through this god-awful subculture of misery that we've created by shoving electronics into the crib. Anyway... Yeah, don't have children. They become teenagers. <sighs> That's fun. So, yeah, anyway, this is uh, an episode that I, it started out as following a basketball game. Then it became, hey, they announced the uh, um, spring football practice schedule. And then, hey, they announced a day and then... Um, another basketball game and then, oh, it was the end of basketball season and then, I don't know, now it's just spring episode number one. It's not officially spring on the calendar quite yet, but spring football is moments away, mere moments, a couple of days, but, uh, so this particular episode is going to be most likely just a, I don't know, a quasi-connected melange of random crap that I've made note of over the last few weeks and want to try to wrap up and get back to present day before we, or as we start spring football practice. Did you hear those words? Start Spring football practice. Cross your fingers. Say a couple of novenas. um, Light a tree on fire. Whatever you need to do 
to hope and pray that we actually do get to the start of spring football practice because these days you never know. Dumb shit happens by the hour and it keeps getting dumber. Just when we think that, hey, stupid stuff can't get any stupider, it goes twice as stupid the next time. Although, thanks to the intrepid leadership of the SEC in the college football world, we actually did start and complete a football season last year that I really didn't think was going to happen. I was pretty sure it was going to get started, but I never thought they'd get more than a few games through, much less all the way through, and name a national champion. Sure. Sure. How many games did Ohio State play last year? Like four? Anyway, so let's uh, scroll through the, as I say, disconnected ruminations and see what we've got going on here. Some bees in the bonnet. Um, And uh, basketball. Okay. Basketball season is over. It ended on what I guess you would say is a high note with a with a win. A good win over Tennessee. And then we were... Uh, that was one of the things that took me out of action is we were actually in Auburn um, the weekend of the Tennessee game. Just having a little uh, decompression time in the loveliest village. And for those of you new to the show, I do not live... In Auburn anymore, much to my chagrin. Hopefully we'll get back there before too long, but I am down here, tucked away in the lowest heart of the low country, down here in a teeny little corner of South Carolina, not far from Savannah, Georgia, between Hilton Head, Buford, and Savannah, somewhere in there. But anyway, so we were in town for the Tennessee game, and by the way, Basketball tickets. Now, three, four years ago, you could walk up to the ticket window and get a standing room only ticket for, I don't know, what was it, like six, 12 bucks, something like that. Now, of course, the value of a basketball ticket has increased um, on by orders of magnitude. And you understand, as they should, market-driven uh, supply and demand value. And it's an awesome experience. If you've never been to Auburn arena for a men's basketball game, do your best to get there because it is absolutely everything that they describe on TV. is just better. And what I like to do, the girls get annoyed by this a little bit, but they get over it. Um, I like to buy standing room only. I don't like being jammed into a chair that whenever I want to go get a snack or a drink or go to the bathroom, I got to walk, you know, I got to climb over nine people and all that kind of crap. Up in the upper ring in the standing room only area is just fine. You got a a, a little ledge to lean on and set your drink and your snacks on and just chill right there. And you're actually looking down at the same view that the camera has if you're watching it on TV and I prefer that it's it's freer up there there's less people up there I don't know why I'm saying this don't do this don't no one do this it's terrible anyway that's my favorite spot so uh obviously uh, basketball tickets have become more valuable and I don't mind paying a premium for something that has value to me I do not mind that at all I'm happy to do it I contribute to my university in more ways than one, and that is one of them. However, one of the values of attending a live sporting event to me has been, is, and always will be the atmosphere of the live game, the arena, the stadium, the crowd. You know, nine or 90,000 people wearing your colors and screaming in unison and cheering together for victory, all that kind of stuff, the band, the cheerleaders, the whole thing, all be, and when you have 1,800 or so people 
in an arena for about built for about nine thousand for a basketball game. It's just dead. There's no vibe. They, I mean, there's a little bit. It kind of gets up there, but you're spread out, and it just doesn't get loud. There's no home court advantage anymore. I mean, with COVID rules. Hopefully, that'll all end by the end of this spring, but we'll see. I don't believe that um, the post-postmodern um, controllists, let's say, who have slithered their way in to the corners of power will will let go of the control of the public that they've kept an iron grip on for the last year. But we'll see. They're going to squeeze hard enough for long enough and people are going to absolutely lose their shit if they try to keep this going. They're trying to bribe everybody right now with a... Uh, <clears throat> relief bill anyway basketball 1800 people in an arena built for about 9000 is not fun therefore the dichotomy of value versus value and scarcity versus my resources and my desire to attend the sporting event which my desire to attend it was great and you couldn't get a ticket there was no one I don't know if they threatened anybody uh, next to the whole people selling tickets. Let's not use the S word, but people selling tickets around the venue as you would normally find. Even people with extra tickets, you know, got hey, I got two more over here. You want to come in? I need two here. None of there was none of that. There were barely any humans around the main entrance of the arena at tip off just before tip off of that Tennessee game. And, of course, I'm looking on the, um, uh, what do they call them? Secondary market sellers online, you know, all of them. Uh, and they have tickets to this game that had just tipped off seconds before for $300 plus. And I'm thinking, you genuinely have to be kidding me. I'm not paying $600 to get my wife and myself into a basketball game. And let's face it, I love my Auburn Tigers. I love my team. I love the guys on the team, but it's it's a down year. So the value for the scarcity is not there. You take away the crowd. You take away um, any sort of payoff for this game, a uh, win or a loss, and and six hundred six hundred dollars to go sit in a twenty percent full arena with no no payoff at the end is ab- absurd. And I even went up to the ticket window and said, "Hey, stupid question, but do you have anything? Did anything get released? Any no shows? Any this? Any will calls? Anything got released? Nope. You can try. Blah blah blah. So I did." And I even thought, well, I'll keep refreshing this particular ticket selling uh, app that I have. And I'll see the further it gets into the game, because they got to have an algorithm that decreases the ticket prices as you get further past the starting point. Because otherwise, whoever had their tickets on there is just going to lose them. And what's the point of that? And it got all the way to halftime. We walked over to... A uh, an eating establishment with a colossal wall-sized television and sat there. It, it was actually better than sitting in the arena. There was, I don't know, 200 people inside this restaurant all watching a basketball game, all cheering and eating and drinking and doing all that. And that was a hell of a lot of fun. That was the same. It was the same vibe as just about as a full arena with the view, the size of that TV, the view basically the same view and I didn't pay $600 but anyway by halftime those that ticket listing had gone down to about oh, they, I think they got all the way down to 80 bucks 
So then it was, are we going to walk over at halftime and pay $160 plus the fees? So probably over to north of $200 to go sit and watch a half of basketball. And I just, I couldn't get there, man. It's a bummer. So I'll pay a pre. I'm never paying 600, three, 300 bucks for a ticket to get into a basketball game. I won't, I wouldn't pay 300 bucks for a ticket to get into a football game. I've been to zillions it's better sitting in a football stadium sucks other than being there with everybody it's just not a good experience and and the the conversation regarding the in-game experience particularly for football where you're sitting outside in a giant walk baking to death at any game prior to mid-november The amenities suck. The metal benches suck. The Wi-Fi sucks. It's just essentially about being there with the people and screaming and supporting your team, which I will do as much as I can, but my resources have to be allocated to places that are responsible. And I know I should just go ahead and get back into the season ticket pool, but we'll see how that goes. It's a five-hour drive for me. And to do that, whatever, six, seven times a year. And I know I could resell the tickets. But anyway, we're getting way down. I got there from being in town for a basketball game. So anyway, basketball season is over. And with the end of it on the last game, uh, everyone's favorite. Well, almost no one's favorite except Auburn people and folks from southern Indiana. Bruce Pearl, Mr. Coach Bruce Pearl. Won his 600th game. Good for him. By the way, the NCAA and various other entities and people in the college basketball world who seem to have a giant stick up their ass for Bruce Pearl need to, uh, well, they need to pound sand. So 600 wins for BP. Uh, that includes a record of 231 and 46 at Southern Indiana. And in Milwaukee, remarkable, remarkable work. The man does remarkable work wherever he goes. 86 and 38 with a sweet, sweet 16 run at Milwaukee and other tournament appearances there, I believe. And then over at uh, um, Jumpsuit Orange, we got 145 and 61. And then with our beloved Auburn Tigers, Bruce Pearl at the helm, he has amassed a 138 and 92 record with a final four appearance. Should have been a national championship, but apparently standing four feet, staring at a four feet away from a guy that you're staring at who double dribbles in a final four game where you're supposed to be the elite of the elite officiating crew. I don't know. Apparently, that's just not a thing we're going to worry about. So, basketball didn't exactly end like we wanted it to. Didn't exactly begin or stretches in the middle like we wanted it to. But you cannot ignore the fact that this team was an incomplete team from the beginning all the way through. There's no use rehashing it all of that because if you need to be anyone who needs to be told how and why this was not a complete team through the season and also be reminded that it was the second youngest team in the entirety of NCAA basketball. Well, you can't be helped. So there's that. They did what they did. They were fun to watch. If you have some kind of agenda, if you bitch about Bruce Pearl or some of the players because they lost a basketball game, Dude, you got to get a grip. You genuinely need to get a grip. And you're you're some kind of coattail bandwagon jumping fan and fan schman, whatever. You, you're either part of it or you're not. And I'm not saying we don't criticize things that deserve to be criticized, but what's the point of talking about a team that was incomplete, didn't have a point guard for most of the year, didn't have the ace shooting guard 
for most of the year. Never, those two never played together, I don't think. Did they play one or two games together? Maybe, but I can't recall. Right there in the middle somewhere. When the NCAA decided to stop fucking with Sharif Cooper. Because apparently they're just petty assholes. Uh, but anyway, and so your big, uh, your uber talented freshman stretch five, stretch four, stretch five, stretch four, crazy talented. He's just a baby, just a baby little basketball player. Got so much to learn and so much room to grow. But uh, basically a high school senior playing against elite competition. So uh, there's that. And basically not a heck of a lot much else. A lot of young'uns. A lot of people learning positions, learning skills, all that kind of stuff. There's plenty of plenty of daylight on the horizon for this squad. But uh, if, if you got... I can't, some of the players, I can't believe some of the crap, some of the criticism I hear about some of these guys. I mean, come on, man. If you are trashing Alan Flanagan for anything in the world, you're an idiot. You're dead to me. You have no gravitas. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. There is no reason to get into the numbers because if you're listening to this, it's likely you've listened to every other show that's going on out there and you know what Al- how Alan Flanagan's numbers improved across the board. And then spent, I don't know, the better half a year, nearly, I don't know, whatever, 30% of a year playing out of position and then filling, backfilling a position in the rotation. So enough of that shit. But, uh, you know, Sharif, I'm a bit more critical of Sharif than a lot of people. And this comes from an analytical place of love because this guy's awesome. He's going to be fantastic. He's got, I guess, a limitless ceiling. Because his basketball IQ seems off the charts. And, but he's, there's, you know, we say, oh, he's got holes in his game. Everybody knows that. Everybody sees it. His shooting, he can't shoot a basketball for some reason. Uh, Long range. He's got no, his three point shooting is horrendous. Um, his defense is marginal. His, if you go back and look at some of the film for all the crazy ass vision and passes, court vision and those crazy passes that he he made throughout the season, he made a lot of stupid turnovers too. A lot of, I don't know if you want to call them maybe quasi effort related turnovers, maybe on the level of something like he could do this in high school without even thinking about it, but when everyone around him is 6'9 or taller, the passing lanes shut down and quicker and all that kind of stuff. And so there's so much to work on for him. And I don't know. We had the discussion on what we, we don't say what players should do. He should stay. He should go. No, what he should do is analyze his situation and do what is best overall for a complete life for Sharif Cooper. He could benefit monstrously from another year in college in more ways than one, but he can also get the same kind of, if if not maybe a higher level, of training and coaching on the next level. And he's not going to play on an NBA roster next year. G League, whatever. And so he'll get the same kind of development. It's just a matter of whether he wants to do it in more of a, uh, let's say, a meaningful way. Trying to make a uh, conference championship run and a deep run into the NCAA tournament. And that's all I got to say about that. So the rest of the roster is just a bunch of young'uns learning. 
And uh, there's going to be some roster turnover. There's going to be things coming in and out, going. So we'll see how it goes. And, of course, we heard the other day that Justin Powell is transferring, which I don't understand. I don't understand. There's no speculation to be done here. There's no... um, There's no wringing of hands. There's no... There's nothing to really say about this until... If it ever, if if he ever decides to say really why he's transferring, but the sky was the limit for that dude, and I was really looking forward to JP coming back and being that shooting guard, that sharp shooter on the wing. Because my God, more than anything in the world, we needed a shooter this past season. Holy cow, we could not shoot, and our our shooters, Devin, well, I mean, Devin Cambridge, I I love you, Devin Cambridge, but what, man, you cannot be, you can't be that streaky. You just can't. Dylan Cardwell, I liked him from the beginning. Again, stop criticizing the dude like he's supposed to be, you know, on the level of a junior or senior that you see around the SEC and around the country. He's a freshman. I like his I like his skill set and I like his attitude. And remember, you cannot complete a championship team with a bunch of five star one and duns. A bunch of McDonald's all Americans. You gotta have anchors, foundations, bases, guys that stay three and four years, continuity. Leadership, and I see Dylan Cardwell bringing that to the table. So that's a wrap on basketball. They did what they did. I watched every game. Sometimes I was aggravated. Sometimes it was, a lot of times, it was incredibly joyful because you have to, have, if unless you didn't understand what we had going on. First of all, it was a rebuilding year and kind of ramping up getting everybody, getting all the young guys ready for next year. Everybody said that from before the beginning. And then Sharif was whatever the NCAA was doing to him. And then JP. And then just all the things, you know, all the things. So it is what it is. War Damn Eagle to those guys. We love you and we will see you work hard in the offseason. Train. Train. Get better, get bigger, get stronger, get faster, and we'll see you back here before we know it, right? So that's basketball. Um, Football, there's some things. I spent a long time on that. I don't have much time left. So basically, all right, here's a thing that I've been hearing other places. Not everywhere, not a lot of places, but other places. So you all know, and here I got to go talking about this fucking guy again. Um, You all know how I felt about Gus. If you don't, go back and listen to a few episodes. Uh, Thanks for your service. Appreciate you. Um, Thanks for either not doing anything really stupid or not getting caught doing anything really stupid. Appreciate all that. Um, But the frustration that was there because of the various failures under that regime could not be tolerated any longer. And so when I hear people talking about this dude who has now gone to uh, Central Florida, right? I don't care. Um, rooting, oh, we, well, I hope he does well down there. And, I, and oh, let's, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep an eye on him. Let's watch him, see how he does. And I heard somebody say, should I follow him or unfollow him from Twitter? And first of all, fucking Twitter, who cares? But why? What in the hell do you possibly care about what Gus Malzahn is doing in Central Florida? People are like, oh, we're rooting for Gus to do what? Rooting for Gus? What the fuck? He's not here anymore. He's actually recruiting against us. We recruit heavily in Florida. Central Florida has a lot of resources. They got what? Their undergrad population is something like 
70,000 or something stupid like that. They got all kinds of money and resources. What, what are you talking about rooting for Gus? Essentially, right now, at this point in time, here's what I have to say about that. Fuck that guy. Good God, man. It's like we must be suffering from that that uh, syndrome that that women have after after pregnancy and you know I don't know a year or so on when they want to start having more babies. It's like, did you forget the trauma, the things that we endured are post traumatic stress inducing nonsense because we got our few wins against Alabama we got about no fucking wins against Georgia which I can't get into or I'll have an aneurysm about no wins you know we beat the shit out of LSU twice at home and we're sort of maybe slightly better than average against the rest of the damn conference But because of those highs, because of that 2013 syndrome, because of that, holy shit, we can't believe it. 2012 plus 2013 equals mass hysteria. And I suffered from it too. Let me not cast stones. I will not take the speck out of my brother's eye without removing the beam from my own. But you have to let that miasma clear out from the atmosphere and look at what all the things that happened and look at it down more on a micro level than on a macro level like how many wins or dumb shit like that the the lack of player development the utterly mind-boggling recruiting listen to the stories that are told about when Cody Burns, I think, was up in somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon or Washington, somewhere up there recruiting, what, the number one? Was it the number one receiver in the country at the time? Or he was recruiting, or, or that guy wanted to be recruited by Auburn, I think it was. I, I apologize for fucking this story all up. But regardless, the response was, yeah, we don't really recruit up there or something to that nature. doesn't matter. It was, the, the point is that recruiting for the most part, was, if not disastrous, then nonsensical. Player development. You want to bitch about Bo Nix? Well, Bo Nix doesn't coach and develop himself. And there's no doubt that he's one of the hardest working people you'll ever see. If you were at that, I've said this before, but if you were at that spring game a couple of years ago where the competition was between Nix and Gatewood, it was clearly... Clearly, no question who was the better quarterback that day, and it was Bo Nix by a mile. So, Bo Nix looked better to me in that spring game, his freshman year, than he does now. So, is that Bo, Is that on Bo Nix, or is that on the people that are paid millions of dollars to develop a five-star quarterback into something higher than he was in high school? Every quarterback that came through under the previous regime digressed or excuse me regressed in some fashion Nick Marshall kind of changed himself in from 13 to 14 and by sheer will and athleticism did not go backwards he was just doing different things he was passing more running a sort of a different style of offense which is another thing pick something So, yeah, miss uh, rooting for Gus, I don't get you. I do not get you. I'm not rooting for anybody that's not wearing orange and blue. So, dovetailing out of that into spring football, spring practice commencement date is set March 16th, 15-ish practices with A-Day being April 17. Hallelujah. College football is back. Maybe we'll get something that's actually looks more like the college football that we knew and loved prior to that year last year and I'm going to touch on this again 
from what I hear and read, many Auburn people are entering this new football era with trepidation and uncertainty and fear. But I want you to put those emotions to the side and embrace this new start as you would, I don't know, goodies powder and Gatorade after power drinking. Because this malaise of uncertainty in which many Auburn folks are stumbling about is just a bad hangover from a toxic combination of crap you should never have been talked into consuming. Jägermeister and red wine. That's what the Gus Malzahn era was. Jägermeister and red wine. Think of what's coming our way as lean protein, fresh fruits and vegetables and spring water after spending the better part of a decade shoving ramen noodles, frozen pizza and diet coke down your gullet. And I know I'm mixing metaphors here like a crazy person. So here's another. This coaching change is the world's greatest enema. A cleansing of epic proportions. Everybody's... I don't know, everybody. Things that I hear and read indicate um, person, uh, coaching staff, recruiting. I don't know. I mean, what are we doing? Uh, uh, we'll see, I guess. We can't judge him until, you know, a series of uh, seasons and a one-loss record and recruiting over a couple of years. You know what? Stop. Be happy. Right now, you should be as happy as you've been in quite some time about this football program. Because the things that are coming your way are evident that the thing that I've been talking about for so many years is being implemented. And that is a coherent strategy with execution of a plan. Whereas previously, we would enter each season, for example, not, I don't know, it seemed like the Pop Warner coach who got a new group of players every year and had to start from scratch and kind of couldn't figure out what everybody's deal was until about three or four games in. And then had a couple of great games and scored 70 points against no one. And then all of a sudden did really dumb shit that was different from the things he was doing, scoring 70 points for no, absolutely no reason. Schizophrenia, schizophrenic coaching, unmoored, unhinged, seemingly baseless, random coaching. It's gone. There is a plan in place being executed, and you should be happy about it. Things that have driven us crazy for so long, all the Gus PTSD stuff that we talk about. Recruiting, player utilization, roster management. There's a plan. Nathan King wrote an article, and there's there's a bunch of little examples out there of context clues that should tell you what's going on and make you happy about it. So Nathan King wrote an article and the part that jumped out to me, which I highlighted and took in here was Parsons said the team is not yet. And this was written, I don't know, probably a week ago. Maybe Parsons said the team is not yet where it needs to be heading into the spring, but that's by design. There's a plan. As opposed to, well, we ain't where we should be right now, but we're going to work real hard at it. They'll be exactly, back to the article, they'll be exactly where he and the coaching staff want them to be developmentally at all times. Does that sound like a plan and a strategy? Being executed? Yes, it does. Parson said he doesn't want players or coaches getting ahead of themselves this winter, spring, summer, or fall. His master plan, I'm sorry, let me back up for a second. His master plan is for the team as a whole to be peaking right before the first game and not a moment sooner. So basically what you can take from that, you can forget everything that was said and take from that 
there is a plan being implemented and executed. That's all you need to know about that. The rest of it is filler. The rest of it is not for you to worry about. Go live your life until the start of football season. Come on back, enjoy some spring workout news and go to A-Day. Hopefully they'll let us in. There's a plan in place. All of those things that used to just absolutely make our eyes bleed. Like Harold Joyner. What the fuck is Harold Joyner doing? No one knows. No one. None of us knew. Nobody on the coaching staff knew. None of the players knew. What's he doing? I don't know. We'll put him in for like six plays a year. Why did you recruit the guy? You can say that about half the damn roster. (sighs) Somebody the other day was talking about ranking the uh, running backs under that previous regime. And it sounded to me, they started listing names, and it sounded to me rather like a list of running backs whose careers were derailed, damaged, or ruined by stupid, incompetent coaching head scratching and the reason it's so aggravating is because we we're pretty sure that they weren't incompetent we don't know why they acted incompetent from time to time in bizarre times didn't seem to want to beat our main rivals loved beating the shit out of Arkansas um So, yeah, player utilization. Like Sean Shivers. I I just... Sean Shivers is a bowling ball that's really incredibly stupid fast. But he's, what, five foot seven? Something like that? And you're going to run him up into a bunch of six foot five tackles, defensive tackles and, and guards with linebackers crashing down because they all knew what the hell was coming. I don't know why. Why in the hell was that guy not running about nine wheel routes a game? Put him in the slot. You get that dude in space and then put the ball in his hands. See what happens. Player utilization. Just staggering. Do we even need to go down the tight end thing? You're just going to be, forget about everything else. You're going to be so ecstatic about the dimension that actually utilizing a tight end like everybody in the freaking NFL and everybody on the elite level of college football does. Oh, that's going to be fun. And the roster. You talk about this recruiting class, and I think everybody's becoming a little bit happier now that some some more things have developed like I said forget about you forget about this recruiting class it's good enough to win given what the coaching staff the new coaching staff had to do to tie it all to keep you know tie it together keep it from falling apart but you don't forget about the players that are already there this is that goes back to that moronic roster management that we saw for almost a decade we go through the winter and spring and look at recruiting classes and go sweet we got this four star and this all these four stars and this five star and this and all of a sudden we forget they exist because we never see them again hey wait a minute why is that high four star defensive tack what was his name I don't know he's a junior and he's never played so all that's going to be gone All that's going to be gone. And we're going to be left looking at a football team that either wins or or loses with all of its cards on the table. No rounds left in the magazine. And you should be very happy about that. All right, I've gone incredibly long here today, and so, and I have no idea if I covered things that I wanted to cover or anything interesting to you at all because I kind of did this stream of consciousness just as I said to sort of get caught back up 
and hopefully uh, the progression of life will allow me to do my podcast a little more regularly and start adding some folks, adding some co-hosts and some guests, which I'm trying to do, get the YouTube shit. It's shit is hard to do when we're still dealing with COVID. Um, so anyway, get the YouTube channel kicking and running. I've been doing things with that. We'll get that going soon. But I want to circle back around to the beginning of what I was talking about with sort of history and the importance of living, trying to manage, trying to construct and manage a complete life for yourself, not being one dimensional and uh, reaching back to, to something that I touched on a couple of episodes, which is this whole transfer thing. And, and, you know, like I said, we got Justin Powell, which I don't know. There are good reasons to transfer. Uh, Mustafa Heron transferred because if I'm not incorrect, his mother was ill and transferred to be closer to her to help out. That's a good reason to transfer. Lately, we transfer or we leave, we quit, we go to the NFL or NBA or whatever in the hell it is we're going to do just because, I don't know, we don't get along with somebody or it's hard or uh, I I wanted to be here, but now I want to be over there or I, I I can't get any playing time. Well, that sounds like a you problem. So, rather than learning conflict resolution and rising to any kind of challenge at all, we just want to say, fuck it, I'm leaving. And you can bring an argument to me. uh, Let me, all right, let me make sure that this is interjected in here right now with utter clarity. Zero ambiguity. I am not against transferring and I am not for restricting or getting rid of transferring ultimate freedom ultimate responsibility you want to transfer go it's not the responsibility of an idiot to not be an idiot going forward it's the responsibility of the community that should be built around them which is leaders mentors parents coaches those things that help young people guide them into making sound and reasonable decisions for their lives, not for the moment. Is that clear? I'm not anti-transfer. I am never anti-freedom. But I, I heard somebody talking about this the other day, and it really just tied this back into it about the whole Ted Williams thing. And if you're not a baseball fan or if you're not old, Or if you don't study history, Ted Williams is one of the greatest players in the history of the sport of baseball. And 80 years ago, Ted Williams went from being a great ball player to being a legend. And it wasn't because on that day, he became the last player to ever bat 400 or better for a season. It wasn't because of that. The reason he went from being an all-time great to a legend is because people were telling him to sit out the final few games of the 1941 season to preserve his average. Ted, you got it, man. Just sit down. You're statistically above 400, man. You're going to risk it if you go play more games. Don't play. By the way, does that sound familiar? Hey, man, you're going to risk something. Don't play. Don't play in your bowl game. And and again, I don't care. Play or don't. But make a good decision for your own life. Skip your senior year. Sit out for COVID. Do this, that, and the other. How long, at what point does this stop? This, hey, man, you need to preserve yourself for the next thing. How about you need to prepare yourself for the next thing? And the next thing might just not be sports. So, yeah, at what point does that, I've, I've, when this, when this thing came around, I think it was, I want to say it was right around like Jadavion Clowney. 
when he was at South Carolina, and people were saying, "Man, he shouldn't play his he he should he shouldn't play." Is wasn't I think it was his junior year or something because you got it three years after your high school graduation class date or whatever, and the people were saying, "I think going from his sophomore to junior year, I think." could be incorrect they were saying well he should just not play he should go sit out and be prepared and just prepare himself for the nfl really where does it stop do we get down to eighth grade and say wow this kid he's 14 years old and he's already six foot two and 180 five pounds and can throw the ball real far. I think he should probably sit out all of high school so he can just repair, prepare for college. In fact, you know what? Just sit out all of high school and college and prepare for the NFL. Does that sound absurd? Well, it has to go somewhere. That lot, that line of illogic extrapolates to somewhere and it goes there. And in the meantime, the only thing you're doing is destructing destructing not constructing destructing a word I invented Decon- deconstruct sounds a little too uh, polysyllabic so I wanted to bring it down there destructing lives you are not allowing people to build complete lives and I want you to stop and take a look around at this world today Because this is where it's led. Yeah, so Ted Williams. Ted, you should sit out. Ted said no. And he quoted, he's quoted as saying, I either make it or I don't. In his autobiography, he responds to this coward's refuge of not playing to preserve a record by saying well god that hit me like a goddamn lightning bolt what do you mean i don't have to play today character begets character ball players play ball there's an ethos that's not only not being taught anymore it's being aggressively disparaged and disregarded as valorous The archetypes of history who embody this ethos have been systematically erased from the culture or slandered. And that ethos is fortitude. Fortitude. Our our culture now is a desiccated husk of a corpse that was put down into the dirt by weakness, greed, laziness, and a total rejection of fortitude. Determination, endurance, fearlessness, patience, perseverance, tenacity, stamina, heart, endurance, and spirit. Some of the descriptors of fortitude. I believe in a sound mind and a sound body and a spirit that is not afraid. Does that sound familiar? Auburn people? If not, stop playing video games and looking at porn and take a critical look at your life. Those who denigrate the creed and people who embrace it are the same junior high gutter snipes who spend all your energy tearing down achievers because they make you look bad. And you hate competence because of your own ineptitude. So decent people, of which there are so many of you, Be not afraid to stand up in the face of assholery and elevate the cause and the ethos of fortitude. That's the Auburn spirit. That is the spirit that will build a better world. And with that, I bid you all a good day. And when you rise to the new dawn, put your feet on the floor with determination to be a little bit better than you were yesterday. As a great man said, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And also, how you do anything is how you do everything. But anyway, Auburn stuff. 
right? Orange and blue. Auburn. War Eagle. <sighs> there's more to life than sports. Not much more, but there's more to life than sports. Anyway, thank you for joining me today on this incredibly long overdue episode of Auburn Stuff. Auburn Stuff can be found at auburnstuff.podbean.com on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and lots of other places in the podcast universe. Also on YouTube coming up. If you give a crap about uh, Instagram and Twitter, I don't really do anything on Twitter but because it's awful and horrible. But every now and then I'll post fun Auburn stuff on Instagram, including Uh, The latest shots of Lucy the Border Collie making her first trip to the Plains. Just look for Auburn stuff everywhere. And thank you to everyone on iHeartRadio, which has become by far and away our biggest platform. Um, Support what you like, ladies and gentlemen. It's more important than ever. They're making stuff go away. Actively support what you like. Share it. Support it. However you can do it, donate to it, buy from it. Here in in this world, the best thing in the world that you can do is subscribe, rate, and review. You know how this algorithm shit works with these podcasts and these these YouTube channels. Listen to, listening to it is great and we appreciate it. But if you don't subscribe, click the subscribe button and, and do a rating and a review, then they're just going to bury the show. Share the episodes with a friend, too. I do something a little bit different than everyone else does because that's me. And if you like it, stick around. Um, there's plenty of plenty of content that's, you know, more kind of right up the middle. Stats and, and uh, analysis and all that. Go listen to it. Subscribe, rate, review, and download those guys as well. There's a lot of good stuff out. A lot of good creators out there. I'm happy to see the Auburn uh, broadcast, podcast, vidcast world is growing so much with some with some talented people. So anyway, um, download the Podbean app and subscribe on there, or go to Apple Podcasts or iHeartRadio or wherever in the heck it is that you listen to podcasts and subscribe. I'd like to know where you are. Plus, my little telemetry tells me where I get downloads from, and I like to see where we're where the Auburn family is and where we're spreading the message. So as I get on out of here today, I always like to remind you, be mindful, be fit, be authentic. Sometimes it's all you have, but most of the time it's all you need. And that's fortitude. Until next time. War Eagle, everyone.